Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of SAS Innovate 2025 here in Orlando. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, and I'm sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Scott Hebner. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Great to be working with you. Absolutely. The tech industry is big, but it's also a small world. You, you've been in this industry a long time. You're running into all sorts of people you've known from past jobs, past lives. I am. Like tons of them, including someone who's in some IRA. <laughs> exactly. With that, I would like to welcome our next guest, uh, Alice McClure, Senior Director of Product Marketing at SAS. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming on. Thank you. You guys worked together at a, at a former employer. Yes. This yes. is a huge treat to see Scott. Yeah. It's been a little while. So uh, so this is awesome to yeah. be able to chat with you. You did say I didn't age a bit. Oh, not so, a bit. Yeah. And you wanted to I make caught sure, that. You want yeah. to make sure that that, came, that got on yeah. camera, too. Yeah. That on yeah. record. Put, put it into the ledger for the rest of the That will be your lower Third. Exactly. <laughs> I <laughs> love it. Aged a bit. So, Alice, you lead product strategy here at SAS. So, why don't you start by walking us through SAS's long track record with decisioning and how it's evolved with Agentic AI and the work you're doing today? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I have to tell you, the Agentic AI space is a bit of it's a bit of a bread and butter space for us. And uh, yes, there's a long track record. Um, and we've been doing this for years and years, perhaps not calling it agentic AI, but the decisioning space is, is definitely a bread and butter. And, you know, if you, I, if I take a step back and I think about the market on a whole, and I think about, well, the hype around agentic AI, what, what, what's really driving it the most? And there's lots of drivers, of course, but I, I think one big aspect of it is the autonomy um, of the agents themselves and the, the fear in the system around that autonomy. And that autonomy can be very good and very useful for certain use cases. The personal productivity use cases, right? Even outside of the enterprise, uh, you're looking at you know, personal assistants, you're looking at schedulers, you're looking at shopping bots. And we love these things, right? These are great uh, in many respects. But as you look to the enterprise, of course, it starts to become a conversation around governance, um, around the traceability of decisions around the auditability of what these agents are doing and being able to trace it back to the original data that informed it all. Yeah. So it's a big conversation. And again, one that we've been involved with for many years. I, when we look at, when we look at the macro audience of who we're targeting here, um, it's really the builders and buyers of AI, ultimately. So you think about the builders, they, they're, they need to be personally productive. They're, the teams that they work on need to be personally productive. The buyers need to be able to um, address very complicated business cases and address very complex, ultimately, outcomes that they're looking to achieve. And so it's those two audiences that ultimately our Agentic AI strategy is really all about and making sure that we're serving them with the right tools and the right solutions. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned that um... AI agents, agentic AI means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. From, from a SaaS perspective, you have AI assistants that people have become accustomed to. They're built on Gen AI. Now you have the rise of AI agents that a lot of people are just trying to figure out well, like, what that is. And then, of course, agentic systems. How would you sort of simplify that for people on the SaaS Absolutely. You? We know, I, and, and you almost, you said it, uh, you summarized it very well in terms of, we, we do think about it like a three pillar strategy ultimately. Mm -hmm. And it does start with AI assistance. And yes, it's, it's more generative in nature, but it's all about helping people to do work in our software. So whether they're, they're executing code um, and we can help them to, um, to develop that code, ultimately to explain the code as well. And then also building model pipelines within the SAS via platform. So there's these via co-pilots that, yes, are generative in nature, pulling in LLMs, of course, um, that builders of AI, those assistants are so important. But moving into the really core agentic space around decisioning is, you know, the building, the deployment, and the governance of agents. And enabling that to happen and enabling that to happen, of course, in a low code, no code mechanism where you're able to bring in business rules, you're able to bring in the workflow, the path to decisioning, and you're able to bring in both deterministic and non-deterministic models into the mix and be able to track the path of that decision and govern it along the way and have lineage all the way back again to where you started with the data. 
And then the third aspect of this, there's a lot, we've got a lot going on, is the package agents. So, you know, pre-packaged, pre-built models and agents. And those are very use case specific, of course. Um, and they really are meant to address those very targeted and, and um, narrow situations that either run uh, off of our platform directly or off of our software and solutions, or they can be standalone uh, in nature as well. Alice, let's talk about trust, because as yeah. Scott often says, no one's going to use these things if they don't trust them. This is a big part of conversations around AI, particularly at a time when AI is becoming more powerful and hallucinations are getting worse. From your perspective, what are the most important factors in building AI systems that organizations and end users can actually rely on? 100%. It you know, it goes back to, I, I will say, a lot of what we do around AI ultimately does go back to decisioning. And for us, certainly as we build our software, uh, we have all sorts of mechanisms in place. We have our data ethics practice that, you know, when we build software in and of ourselves, uh, that is a, a hugely governed process, of course. But when we look at the decisioning process for our customers, that, that process in and of itself is truly the governing mechanism to where you're putting the decision flow into place. Um, you're pulling in the different types of models that you have already championed uh, through using the VIA platform and part of our model management systems. You're pulling that decision together and that in and of itself is a governing mechanism to where you can continue to have the lineage and the traceability of those decisions and see them happening in real time and see the path to decision, see how things are flowing Make sure that you are building in a learning mechanism uh, as you go to where you know that you're going to need to tweak that decision flow and those models at some juncture. You need to be able to go and look at those models. And we have a mechanism to do that by way of using model cards, where at any point in time you can go in and take a look at the model and almost we, we call it a, like a nutrition label for your model. You can see the health of it, you really can. And, and it's those types of mechanisms that are so important to constantly be aware of ultimately the health of your decisions and the health of those agents therein. Yeah, you know, you think about digital labor, digital coworkers, you know, they're designed to give people, humans, you know, superpowers, right? And I, you know, the trust thing in, in my view has two sides to the coin. One is the explainability, the understandability, you know, I trust this thing in the sense of the integrity of it, right? And it's my, it's my uh, coworker, right? Very smart one too. Uh, the other side of the coin, which I think you got, you touched on a couple minutes ago, is if you are working, you're generally working in some very specific domain. I'm doing legal contracts. I'm doing CRM. I'm doing you know labeling of um, you know drugs at a, at a pharmacy. I'm doing something very domain specific, which also is in an industry, right? And so you have to have decisions that really understand your domain. I think. Really? With your models and your pre-built agents, you're ta tackling that, right? That that is a huge part of what we're tackling. Um, you know, we SaaS is really our foundational go-to-market. Uh, certainly, is uh, with our core technology, uh, but our our industry uh, lens of it all and the expertise that we bring to bear there is something that SaaS has been known for decades. And so, taking that expertise and that experience with our customers and being able to package that in a pre pre-packaged, ready to deploy model or, or agent, if you will, um, that is where we really saw a major opportunity and demand from our customers to be able to do just that. So it is very specific to, you know, medication adherence or payment integrity. Uh, document analysis certainly is, is one of the example models as well. Very narrow, very specific, and right up our alley with the engagements that we've been having with customers for years and years. So, how do you make sure that your AI agents are aligned with business goals, particularly at a time when there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the business environment, um, new strategies, market shifts, tariffs? Um, how do you make sure that, that the agents are aligned? Yeah. I, I get this question a lot, actually, but, and it, it's usually on the more negative side of the coin, which is how do we make sure that things don't get out of alignment? And um, it's, it can be very fear-based in that way. And I certainly understand that it, it's what the decisioning, it's what decision intelligence is all about, is about setting up the business rules, incorporating the LLMs 
prepping the data, running the champion models, pulling the right models into that decision process, and aligning the totality of that flow with the associated business goal that you have. That's what decision intelligence is all about. And yes, the incorporation, be able to build agents as part of that and to be able to deploy them and govern that um, is, is even more of a benefit, frankly. But if you don't have decision intelligence and you are a little bit more arbitrarily deploying agents uh, across your business that have you know, kind of a narrow application, if the human isn't in the loop, uh, obviously that can lead to a lot of concerns. So we definitely recommend that humans be, we would take a really a hybrid approach, but recommend that more often than not, you know, humans do need to be in the loop, right? In some way, shape or form. So I, to answer your question, it's, it's really, it's what decisioning is all about, is setting yourself up in direct alignment with those goals and then building the process and business roles to ultimately help you get there. You touched on um, the human in the loop, the human not in the loop. In the keynote this morning, you had three dimensions, right? You had governance and trust, all right? Then, yep. then you had um, decisions, which is what this is all about. So yeah. You talked about those two things. What about the human in the loop versus not having the human in the loop? And how do you, how do you balance that? Absolutely. You were paying attention in the keynote. <laughs> I was. Taking copious notes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, how do you balance that? So in... You know, I suppose I could use an example, perhaps. Uh, if you uh, One of the examples that was shared on the main stage was all about home loan and the loan application process and where can you inject agents along the way as you step through that process. And it's, it's a, a potentially a very complicated uh, process that could be fraught with error um, bias. And, and bias, yes, depending on, depending on the models you're using and how those models have been trained. Um, so, you know, you can look at the upfront process, for example, and say, okay, maybe there is an initial agent that can be deployed where the human is, is maybe less in the loop. That is the initial uh, review of that application. But then from there, my goodness, the human has got to become part of that process to check for some of those disastrous things that can potentially and do potentially happen as as we saw the statistics that brian was going through it happens and so the checks and balances along with the software along with the automation of it all um looking at those processes and ultimately determine what's right and the agents that you employ that do have the human in the loop being specific being very clear about what's the role that you want the human to play and when. I think it's nice to say, oh, the human will be in the loop and then we'll, we'll pause and we'll check things. And But to be clear about the role of the agent, the role of the human is part of, I think, a very important aspect of the design process of these agents to be clear and concise as we go. Yeah, I imagine the more you trust the agent, the more it proves itself, the more you can unleash it to be autonomous. Yeah. So you're touching on... Yeah. They make decisions, we, you know, you govern them to create trust, and then the more autonomous they become, the more valuable they are right. to the enterprise, but you have to trust them first, and yeah. that unleashes them. Yeah. You're, you're exactly. addressing all three dimensions of an agent, so that's yep. great. So how do organizations get started, especially at a time where they're under a lot of pressure to, to, to implement AI and they're excited about the potential of tapping into agentic AI? What, what do you recommend as a practical first step and how to start? Generally speaking, I would say start with what you know. Start with your domain expertise. Start with a problem that is sizable enough to be important, but don't, you know, don't shoot for the moon, don't shoot for the stars just yet. Start with something tactical where you can prove the success and you learn a couple lessons along the way and then grow. I mean, this is like any probably basic life advice. But start, try to get some of those initial successes under your belt. Um, keep humans in the loop, no doubt. As you expand, you can start to have a better idea of where some of that more uh, complete autonomy can be. But again, I, if it's, it's general advice, then it depends certainly on the situation, the customer's needs and use cases. But I think that that's probably the safe way to go um, the logical way to go to where you can build on those successes 
get the incremental budget that you may need to build on that in the future. Uh, but you're going to want to have a couple wins under your belt yeah. to start. With some points on the board, then you start to grow, okay. grow from there. Um, and ju just for clarity, the place to get started with SaaS is via. There's not some new product. I mean, you're building that capability in. And so ah. it's the same thing people are used to. It's just now has a gentle capabilities and features. It, it's that bread and butter. Yeah, it's SaaS via, which has been in market for years and years. And um, in the intelligent decisioning, application that is core to the SAS via platform, which we've also had market for years and years. Yes, that's, uh, that is really the place to start. And, um, and we also talked about the prepackaged models as well. That is, that is, um, separate outside of intelligent decisioning and via, but it's directly aligned in terms of a lot of those models run directly off of via. La well. Last question, future oriented. What is exciting you most about this space in terms of where AI is headed and for enterprises. Very cool. I am excited. I'm excited for the fear to get out of the system a bit more. I'm excited to see customers winning with agent deployments. Um, I'm excited for us to, for the market in general to have a level of confidence um, and feel empowered around these kinds of decisions and building these kinds of decisions. So that I, that's what I look forward to is I think everyone's kind of settling into this and, and thinking about this from a decisioning perspective, um, which helps you think about it more holistically versus I think just Here. autonomous agents that are a bit of a one-off kind of strategy. Excellent. Excellent. So some cautious optimism is what we want more of. Alice, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. A great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Rebecca Knight for Scott Hubner. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of SaaS Innovate 2025. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.